Welcome to Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Roberts. And I'm Yochanan El Rome. In our top story, three Israeli soldiers were murdered by an Egyptian police officer. Mohammed Salah Ibrahim infiltrated Israel illegally and gunned down 19-year-old Sergeant Leah Ben Noon and 20-year-old Staff Sergeant Ori Yitzhak Iluz in their guard post on the Egyptian border. The ensuing manhunt ended in a bloody firefight which claimed the life of a 20-year-old Staff Sergeant Ohad Dahan and left another IDF soldier wounded. The terrorist was found in possession of a Quran, the Muslim prayer book, food, an assault rifle, six fully loaded magazines, and two combat knives. Officials believe that he intended to perpetrate a large-scale attack, killing as many Jews as possible. This is one of the most serious security events on the Egyptian border since Cairo and Jerusalem signed the 1979 Egypt-Israel Peace Treaty. The International Atomic Energy Agency has concluded its investigation into the Iranian nuclear activity at the Maravan and Fordo sites. This comes after samples of uranium enriched to 83.7 percent were discovered at the underground facility at Fordo, and radioactive material was located at the undeclared nuclear site of Maravan. Despite overwhelming evidence that Tehran is enriching and stockpiling uranium for its nuclear weapons program, the IAEA concluded its probe, announcing that it is satisfied with Iran's explanation for possessing man-made uranium. Israel's foreign ministry accused the director general of the IAEA of yielding to Iranian political pressure and said closing the case conveys the message that Tehran can continue to deceive the international community while achieving a full military nuclear program. The baffling decision by the UN's nuclear watchdog to drop the investigation comes as news of secret meetings between high-level White House and Iranian officials have been taking place in New York. Rebecca has more on that story. The Biden administration is reportedly looking to restart the Iranian nuclear agreement, which some have called the worst deal in history. Robert Malley, the special envoy to Iran, reportedly met with Tehran's ambassador to the United Nations in New York at least three times in the last month. The Financial Times daily newspaper described the meetings as part of a shift in the Biden administration, which is concerned that Iran's continually expanding activities could trigger a regional conflict. The International Atomic Energy Agency has found Iran to be in possession of 23 times the amount of enriched uranium allowed by the 2015 obama broker Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action Agreement. The head of the U.N. nuclear watchdog organization has stated that the rogue Islamic Republic currently has enough to enrich uranium for several nuclear bombs. Jerusalem fears that a new agreement could legitimize Iran's nuclear activity and diminish support for military action against it. More than 40,000 people flooded the streets of New York City to support the Jewish state in the annual Celebrate Israel Parade. It's been described as the world's largest expression of solidarity with the Jewish state. Tens of thousands came out to demonstrate that they stand with the only democracy in the Middle East and the world's only Jewish state. Several Israeli politicians traveled to the Big Apple to take part in the mega event, which turned Manhattan's 57th Avenue into a sea of blue and white. New York Governor Kathy Hochul, Mayor Eric Adams and New York Attorney General Tish James joined Israeli dignitaries on the march in support of Israel. Israel and the Gulf state of Bahrain are set to sign a free trade agreement. Jerusalem's ambassador to Manama Eitan Ne'e explained that Bahrain will become a gateway for widening ties with Arab countries in the region. In an exclusive interview with the Jewish News Syndicate, Na'e said the island kingdom can be the point of connection between East and West, and that the free trade agreement has the potential to widen Israel's connections, not only with Bahrain, but to the Arab Gulf states as well. Eli Cohen was in the Philippines recently for the first official visit by an Israeli foreign minister in 56 years. Cohen said Israel is working to strengthen ties with rising powers in Southeast Asia, and he stressed that the visit will create opportunities in the region. He was joined by an Israeli business delegation, including members of the Israel Export Institute, which works to establish trade opportunities and joint ventures with other nations. The team focused on agriculture, energy, cyber, and security awareness, as well as health and emergency preparedness. 
The Israeli delegation also visited South Korea, where they discussed cooperation in robotics, artificial intelligence, and the automotive sectors. The head of the Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, has signed a decree criminalizing the denial of the catastrophe of the creation of the State of Israel, or the Nakba, as radical Muslims call it. The order states that anyone found guilty of denying the catastrophe will face up to two years in jail in the PA. The directive classifies the creation of the Jewish state as a crime against humanity. Palestinian leaders are attempting to discourage moderate Arabs from supporting or working with the Jewish state. This legislation is just the latest in a series of punitive measures meant to instill fear among the Arab population and prevent them from making peace with Israel. A new groundbreaking experimental Israeli cancer treatment has a 90 percent rate of success in treating multiple myeloma cancer. Hadassah University Medical Center in Jerusalem has announced an unprecedented achievement in treating what was once considered an incurable disease. The regimen is based on genetic engineering technology called chimeric antigen receptor T-cell therapy, or CAR-T. This groundbreaking treatment boosts the patient's immune system to destroy the cancer. Oncologist at Hadassah Ain Karam announced that 90 percent of patients treated with CAR-T went into complete remission. Professor Paulina Stepinski, head of the Department of Immunotherapy in Children and Adults at Hadassah Hospital, hailed the results, saying, We have evidence of a very positive overall response rate with minimal and mild side effects. She said these are dramatic results and offer huge hope to patients. Three members of the Israeli and Italian intelligence services were killed when their boat capsized on Lake Marjorie in northern Italy. According to a report in the Italian newspaper La Repubblica, the agents were meeting to coordinate efforts to prevent Iran from obtaining advanced weapons. Thirteen Mossad agents and eight members of Italian organizations were thrown into the frigid water when an unexpected whirlwind caused the boat to overturn. Four people drowned, including one Israeli, two Italian operatives, and the captain's wife. The Israeli citizens were airlifted home after the incident, and the body of 50-year-old former Mossad agent Erez Shimoni was transported back to Israel for burial in Ashkelon. In sports news, Team Israel has advanced to the FIFA Under-20 World Cup semifinals. The Israeli squad defeated the dominant Brazilian team in what is being hailed as Israeli soccer's biggest ever achievement. Coach Ophir Chaim dedicated the win to the entire nation of Israel, which he called an amazing, wonderful country. The players dedicated their victory to the families of the three fallen IDF soldiers who were senselessly murdered by an Egyptian police officer. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu celebrated the success, saying our young athletes have made history and brought huge pride to the Jewish state. Israel will now face off against Uruguay after the South American team defeated the United States. Jerusalem has officially recognized the Catlan Reserve as a natural gas discovery, paving the way for its future exploration. Catlan, also known as Olympus, has been developed by the British and Greek gas company Energean. They believe the reserve holds 68 billion cubic meters of natural gas. The discovery and extraction of natural gas in the Israeli economic waters of the Mediterranean Sea has put the Jewish state on the path to energy independence. Israel currently exports natural gas to Egypt and Jordan. Israel Katz, the Minister of National Infrastructure, Energy and Water, explained that the Catlan Reservoir discovery joins other existing natural gas reserves which have already changed the face of the local energy economy and turned the state of Israel into a world energy power. The Israel Allies Foundation held a policy summit in Prague to combat the anti-Semitic labeling regulations that are being enforced throughout Europe. The event was attended by lawmakers in the IAF network who gathered to discuss the European Union's proposed boycott of Jewish products produced in Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem, and the Golan Heights. Legislators from 12 countries attended the summit to strengthen and expand their reactions toward this discriminatory policy. IAF President Josh Reinstein said, The strength of the Israel Allies network allows us to unite Israel's allies throughout the parliaments of Europe and encourage them to work as a powerful bloc against the labeling of Jewish goods. 
Faith-based diplomacy is our best tool to effect real policy change against the anti-Semitic ruling of the European Court of Justice. The state of Arkansas has approved a resolution encouraging trade with the Jewish state and specifically with the biblical heartland of Judea and Samaria. Little Rock signed a Memorandum of Understanding with Israel last year, which promotes technical and scientific cooperation. The MOU explores strategic partnerships in the field of education, history, religion, archaeology, agriculture, and innovation. This new resolution, approved by the Arkansas House of Representatives, aims to expand the existing cooperation. It says the state of Arkansas, which lies in America's heartland, has a special kinship with Judea and Samaria, Israel's biblical heartland. This is apparent by the names of cities throughout Arkansas, which bear the names of biblical cities in Judea and Samaria, such as Bethel, Hebron, Shiloh, and Salem. That concludes the news portion of our show. Stay tuned for Ask the Source with Josh Reinstein. Hello and welcome to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein, and we're here in our beautiful studio in Jerusalem. My guest today is Miguel Munoz. He is the Latin American spokesperson for the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem. Miguel, thank you for being on the show. It is really my honor, Josh. So Miguel, tell our viewers a little about what you're doing with the ICEJ when it comes to Latin America. Well, I just came back from a trip to Latin America visiting four countries. My main goal is to tell the evangelical churches the truth about Israel, the truth about the biblical Israel, the historical Israel, and the modern Israel. And at the same time, to let them know the Hebrew communities and join together and help the Israeli people to do Aliyah. I know you, uh, with a different hat, uh, you were in charge of the Honduran embassy move to Jerusalem. Uh, really amazing, one of the few embassies that moved after the U.S. embassy moved to Jerusalem. Can you tell us a little about that? Well, 26 years ago, Israel took off their embassy from Honduras. Since that very moment, evangelical churches began not only to pray, but to do advocacy, to uh, get closer to different governments, to ask them to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, and at the same time to ask the return of the Israel embassy, as well, of course, to move the embassy. Since then, uh, we have been really involved in getting closer the evangelical people from Honduras, which are majority, to the Jewish people and to the land of Israel in general. So when uh, the last government decided to recognize Jerusalem, we were ready to support. I said we were ready because I used to be part of the evangelical uh, associations that were leading all these efforts to actually move the embassy. I, w I often say it's Christians, not countries that stand with Israel, and we see that in Latin America. Uh, a lot of support coming from Latin America in the last few years, from Brazil, uh, from Honduras, from El Salvador, uh, from different countries, and Colombia, of course. But now it looks like the Christian candidates are losing in the elections, and new leftist candidates are coming in that are anti-Christian, anti-Israel. How is that going to affect the relationship between Israel and Latin America? We, we are aware that uh, uh, left-wing governments in Latin America, they are not friendly with Israel. At the same time, we have seen that there is a new and renewal that allows Christians to get in better position and influence to their governments. We are seeing governments with a strong evangelical convictions regarding recognizing Israel and Jerusalem. Uh, last month we saw that Paraguay elected a new president and they're calling to move their embassy back to Jerusalem. So are we gonna, just going to see this happening? You know, when the Christian candidate wins, they move their embassy to Jerusalem. When a uh, non-Christian candidate wins, they move their uh, embassy out of Jerusalem. How's this all going to play out? Well, uh, first of all, political leaders in Latin America, which are 
oriented to faith-based uh, principle, faith-based, uh, uh, like a, a government, faith-based uh, diplomacy, all these are getting together. They are like doing a whole movement in Latin America. And I said, politicians, uh, legislators, and uh, uh, businessmen, they are getting together and uh, they are like developing a, a regional strategy. At the same time, this uh, reflects on the evangelical people uh, and they respond, they react, and they, of course, uh, join together. And this became a bigger, enthusiastic, and of course, commitment. Evangelical Christianity is growing in Latin America. Uh, we see them becoming the majority in many different countries. As this trend continues, what can we expect to see uh, from these nations vis-a-vis -vis Israel? Well, you can see that every candidate that is committed with their Christian principle is speaking about Israel. They are speaking and they are getting committed. They will repeat this slogan, to recognize Israel is the right thing to do. Miguel, there are literally tens of millions of people watching this show. What message do you have for our viewing audience? My main message is that if you are a Christian, you are demanded by the Word of God to speak like one. So in this case, if you are a businessman, if you are a politician, if you are a leader in your community, you know that Israel is in the heart of the Lord and you can respond with conviction and with commitment and support them accordingly to what you believe. Be sincere and truthfully with your beliefs. Thank you, Miguel, for being on the show. And thank you for tuning in to Ask the Source. I'm your host, Josh Reinstein. Now back to the studio. Up next, the return to Zion with Karen Hayasod. Shalom and welcome to the return to Zion with Karen Hayasod. I'm Sam Grunwork, World Chairman of Karen Hayasod United Israel Appeal the leading official fundraising organization for the State of Israel. Today, all God's people rejoice in Jerusalem, the undivided capital of Israel. God bless you from Jerusalem. Despite enduring thousands of years of danger and persecution, the Jewish people never lost the heartfelt dream of returning home to the eternal city of Jerusalem, to the land of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to King David's capital. Scattered across the four corners of the earth, Jerusalem continued to beat relentlessly in the heart of every Jew. Through the darkest of days, the dream remained to see Jeremiah's prophecy come to life. There is hope for your future. Your children will return to their borders. And 50 years ago, the impossible happened. Exiled, dispersed, and downtrodden for generations, the Jewish people finally returned to Jerusalem. Faced with the might of multiple Arab armies, Israel's soldiers plucked victory from the jaws of tragedy. Finally, Jews could walk in the footsteps of their biblical forefathers and touch the stones of the Western Wall once more. decades since then, Jerusalem has become a city transformed. From the rubble of war, a modern, high-tech metropolis has been built. A political capital and a cultural capital has blossomed. New neighborhoods continue to be built, while cutting-edge medical centers, universities, and research hubs lead the world. 
And all the time, a heavenly tranquility can be felt as the faithful of three religions worship, live, and play in freedom. Jews continue today to flock to Jerusalem to witness and live this modern-day miracle. They arrive from the four corners of the earth to experience a Jerusalem which their ancestors could not possibly have imagined. Soon, the Jews of Israel will outnumber those living in the rest of the world for the first time in two millennia. With the help of Karen Hayasad's supporters, they are making new lives in the land of Israel. The Jewish people are truly coming home. They are part of a thriving, dynamic city a city which stands at the crossroads of the past and the future, the ancient and the modern, where thousands of years of history blend seamlessly with the promise of a better, brighter tomorrow. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will lift up my hand to the nations and set up my standard to the peoples, and they will bring your sons in their bosom, and your daughters will be carried on their shoulders. To this day, Karen Hayasad is helping Jews around the world come home with the help of Jews and non-Jews alike. But the mission is not yet complete. Jerusalem continues to develop, to strive for greater prosperity. Ethiopian Jews continue to arrive, facing the difficult challenge of absorption. The possibilities for this special city, with this special community at its heart, are endless. And together, we can write the next chapter in a history like no other. Let's bless Israel together. To donate and get information, visit khisrael.org. And now, Shining Light from Israel. Located on Israel's eastern border, between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea, is the Jordan Valley. There's no better place to begin this week's episode than here at the Jordan Valley Monument, which memorializes soldiers who were killed in battle while protecting this region. 311 names are written on a plaque next to the monument. Let's continue as we go down to the banks of the Jordan River. And Kesser El Yehud. Kesser El Yehud is Arabic for the Fortress of the Jews. This is the location that Joshua and the Israelites crossed over after 40 years in the desert during the story of the Exodus. And if you know your scriptures, you know that before the Israelites crossed the Jordan River, the Jordan came to a halt and dry land appeared. But the river didn't just freeze, it began to rise up, creating a fortress. And that's why even in Arabic, it's called the Fortress of the Jews, because according to Islamic tradition, the land of Israel is the land of the Jews. In addition to this, according to Christian tradition, this is the location that John the Baptist baptized Jesus. And Christians from around the world and several denominations will come here to baptize themselves in the holy waters of the Jordan River. You can see a group now behind me that's preparing for their baptism, which is an important moment in their lives. One of the things that amazes me about visiting this national park is that just on the other side of the Jordan River is the country of Jordan. And you can see pilgrims that are traveling through that country baptizing themselves on the other side of the Jordan River. And speaking about the biblical river, does it look like the mighty Jordan that we read about when we read our scriptures? Not really. And that's because we siphon roughly 50 million liters of water every year from the Jordan River in order to give it to Jordan as part of our peace treaty that we signed with them in 1994. 
after the Israelites cross the Jordan River, the first city they're going to conquer is the city of Jericho. This is the modern city of Jericho behind me now, but within that modern city is the ruins of the ancient city of Jericho. Bryant Wood and other archaeologists excavating here discovered bricks that date back to roughly the year 1300 BCE, which is the time period that we attribute to Joshua and the Israelites crossing the Jordan River. But what was so amazing about this discovery is that they found bricks both inside the city and outside the city, as if the walls had been split in half and they came tumbling down, just like it says in the book of Joshua. The Bible isn't just a spiritual document, it is a historical document. Kesar El Yehud isn't the only site to see here in the Jordan Valley. There's the biblical city of Beit Sheon, an impressive archaeological site that has deep roots in the Bible. There's also Nachal Kibbutzim and Gana Shosha, one of the most beautiful natural water sites here in Israel. In addition, you can go rafting on the Jordan River and a lot of other great adventures. In and around this entire region are several churches, some of them dating back as far as the Byzantine period, roughly 1,500 years ago, like the one you can see behind me now. One of the more interesting places to visit here in the Jordan River Valley is Naharaim, the hydroelectric power plant that was constructed in 1927 by the modern Zionist Pinchas Rutenberg. The then king of Jordan, Amir Abdullah, granted him permission to use the waters of the Jordan River as long as the plant was on the Jordanian side of the river. And by the early 1930s, it was pumping out 18 megawatts of electricity enough to power the entire city of Haifa, the Jordan River Valley, and Kibbutzim located in the north. However, in 1948, after Israel declared its independence, five standing Arab armies attacked our young nation. It was the Iraqi army that came here and destroyed the power plant. Thanks for tuning in today. And when you're visiting Israel, make sure to come here to the Jordan Valley, to the Jordan River, Kesser El Yehud, where the Jews crossed the Jordan River. That's all for this edition of Israel Now News. I'm Rebecca Roberts. And I'm Yochanan El Rom, reporting from our studio in Jerusalem. Please join us again next week for all of your Israel updates.